150th anniversary of the publication of The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. And it's well worth celebrating because it told us about natural selection, which is the key to understanding all living things from the slime moles to ourselves. There are two things which I find worrying about it. One is that although it's very good at explaining a lot of orchids and fish and birds, it's never been very successful at explaining ourselves. It doesn't tell us exactly why we became naked or bipedal or why we can speak and the apes can't or anything of that kind. For instance, we take one example of why are we naked. On this question, they've not only failed to give an explanation, but they are now failing to ask even the question. If you look at the last 20 books to be published on human evolution, including textbooks and encyclopedias, 500 pages long, and there is not a mention in these books of the fact that we have lost our body hair. Try to imagine that there was one naked species of bear or a naked wolf or a naked rabbit and try to imagine anybody writing a whole volume about the species and failing to mention the fact that they were naked. It's impossible. And I would think that if you've got being naked may not be the most important thing about us, but it's certainly an important thing, it's a valuable clue, and if you've got a narrative that can't account for that, it seems very likely that you're on the wrong track. The second thing that worries me is because we haven't got any answers to these questions, we are now beginning to stop asking the Darwinian question, and that means on the eve of this bicentenary, we are betraying him. Because the whole thing about Darwin was that he said, if you want to know why a species changes and develops, you've got to know what habitat they were living in, what environmental pressures they were subject to, and that is why they changed. And now we have not got any idea and have stopped asking specific questions about what kind of habitat were they living in, when they started to change. What I'm proposing to do is give you a brief history of how this idea has developed, um, an indication of the kinds of data that the aquatic theory is based on, and some questions about where we stand today. When Darwin wrote The Descent of Man, he didn't give any clear idea about what kind of habitat they were living in. If you read that book, there is no indication there that he thought they were in any different kind of habitat than the chimps or the, uh, the last common ancestor. He seemed to think that they were walking on the floor of the forest rather than in the trees, but then gorillas do that. And the first indication uh, for the first few couple of decades after Darwin, that is what people thought. They thought, all right, the first humans, they were living in the forest. And to illustrate that, you've only got to think of Kipling's Jungle Book. He was interested in Darwin and evolution, and he thought they lived in the forest, like Mowgli. And you've only got to look at Hollywood and Tarzan, because Kipling's cousin, Edgar Rice Burroughs, wrote the Tarzan books. And they were envisaging the first naked biped with his big brain swinging through the trees. And that went on until the 1920s, when Raymond Dart found a town skull in South Africa. And he said, I think this was the beginning of humanity. It's not quite like a baby chimp skull. It's got indications of humanity. And since it was found out on the savannah, he said, I think that that is why we are different. This solves everything. Um, the ancestors of the chimps and uh, gorillas stayed in the trees. The ancestors of humans went out onto the savanna. And that is why they're totally different. And from that point on, up until today, 
this is what has been taught in all our schools and universities, that they became different because they lived on a, sav lived on a savanna. And of course they found a few uh, fossils out on what is now the savanna, and where you keep looking is where you keep finding them, so that they were convinced that to unravel all the, all the mysteries, you have to find the bones, fossilized bones, and fossilized teeth. And that will be the best evidence, because it's hard evidence. You know something really lived there. There was only one man in England who didn't agree with us. That was Alistair Hardy. And in 1930, he conceived the idea that perhaps what explains our difference was not living on the savannah, but living in and near the water. He was brought to think that by reading um, in Frederick Wood Jones that he had cut open and analyzed a great many primates and a great many human cadavers. You could get them easily in those days. And he said, the thing that strikes me is whenever you cut open uh, a monkey or a chimpanzee or a gorilla, you come straight to the tissues. When you cut open a human, the first thing you come to is a naked skin and a lining of fat. Why have we got this lining of fat? And Alistair Hardy was a marine biologist, so he knew that this happens if you, if you start cutting open a seal or a dolphin or a great many um, aquatic mammals. What they have got is a naked skin with a lining of fat. And he began to look for other reasons why this might explain human beings. And it occurred to him that if you're a four-legged quadruped, an ape or a chimpanzee walking into the water, before you get in very far, you've got to stand up on two legs in order to keep your head above water so that you can breathe. He knew, as he has said on film, I wanted to be a professor, I wanted to be a fellow of the Royal Society. I knew I couldn't do that if I told anybody what I was thinking. So he sat on it for 30 years. And then finally it got loose. He was in a, he was, he got his professorship, he got his fellowship, and all the honors that could come to him. And he ended up being, being knighted for his services to science. So he was no crackpot. Um, but he thought he could try it out on a subaqua society in Brighton. And he said he had been thinking about this. He thought, I'll just see how it goes down. But in the back row, there was a local reporter sitting. And the local reporter knew he'd struck oil. And he took the story to the Fleet Street. And all the Sunday papers said, Oxford professor says man is a CA. And all Alistair's colleagues and superiors in the science department of Oxford came down on him like a son of bricks. How could you let Oxford down? How could you betray us and make fools of us by giving it such, such a silly idea? And um, you must never do it again. Shut up. So he did shut up. And it what quickly got forgotten. And it was forgotten about for 10 years until I took it up.